Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Rosa Cabrera, director of the Rafael Sintron Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, uh, better known as the LCC. Thank you for joining us in this Zona Abierta online program. And I would also like to thank the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the School of Theater uh, and Music for supporting uh, this program. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Zona Abierta, this is an LCC series that highlights the intersection of the arts, humanities, science, culture, and civic life with presentations by local, national, and international artists, scholars, and community leaders um, talking about pressing social and environmental issues affecting the life of Latinx, um, as well as Latin Americans, uh, while, while also making connections to other communities, uh, especially here uh, in the Chicago area. Today's program is the third of four presentations that the LCC is hosting this semester called Radical Research from BIPOC Scholars at UIC. Um, and this is with scholars who joined the Bridge to Faculty program at UIC uh, during the last two years. Uh, the presenters have been sharing their experiences and respective research through an intersectional lens, revealing the complexity and particularity of the research and how the lives of those in the margins are impacted. Um, and the Bridge to Faculty program, in case you don't know, uh, is a recruitment initiative in the Office of Diversity designed to attract uh, underrepresented postdoctoral scholars with the goal of a direct transition to a tenure track junior faculty position after two years. Uh, today, uh, and the presentation today will be um, by Dr. Xiomara Cornejo from the School of Theater and Music. Uh, and will focus on an ethnographic study she conducted during her apprenticeship at the Bread and Puppet Farm in Vermont in 2016. There, she examined the Bread and Puppet's company practices as perform performance of liberation theology, which manifests the social justice spirit and legacy of El Salvador's Saint Oscar Romero. Um, this presentation will be about 35 uh, to 40 minutes long, followed by a short conversation facilitated by LCC's Associate Director Jorge Menas Rogli. So we invite you to put comments and questions on the chat uh, while the presenter um, is sharing so that Jorge can direct this to our guest speaker after uh, she's done. Uh, now, I am delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Xiomara Cornejo. Uh, Dr. Cornejo is a Salvadoran American theater director, designer, dram uh, dramaturge, playwright, and arts activist from Compton, California. Her professional work includes theater directing, after school arts programming, applied theater and community arts organizing. She received a BA in theater directing and performance from California State University, Long Beach, and her MA in public arts study from the University of Southern California. For over eight years, Dr. Cornejo worked as a community organizer and supervisor under the asset-based community development and relationship-based community organizing model and facilitated neighborhood action councils and social justice art projects. Dr. Cornejo was the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival National first place winner uh, for her uh, dramaturgy on Father Comes Home from the Words, part one, two, and three, and her projection design of Good Kids. Her current research called Performing Resurrection, Upholding the Spirit and Legacy of El Salvador's St. Oscar Romero through Radical Theater was funded by the Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowship in 2020. Her scholarship centers on radical theater history, multicultural theater, political puppetry, 
performance ethnography, dramaturgy, and projection design. And you can check that Dr. Conejo's, uh, Conejo's full bio in the link provided in the chat. Um, so now I would like to welcome, welcome uh, Xiomara. Uh, bienvenida. Uh, and it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK. Um, first, thank you, everyone, for being here with me on this rainy Wednesday uh, and sharing this virtual space with me today. I'm Xiomara Cornejo, and I'm really excited to share my photo ethnographic study, uh, share some excerpts and journal entries from a chapter of my current manuscript project titled Performing Resurrection, of Holding the Spirit and Legacy, and that's my dog in the background, <laughs> of El Salvador, St. Oscar Romero, through Bread and Puppets and Mecates Theater Activism and Liberation Theology. Uh, this manuscript begins with Salvadoran priest, Archbishop Oscar Romero, when amidst death threats by the right-wing military- Yumara. Yes? This is Jorge. Um, your screen looks like a black uh, gray screen to us. So. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, just making sure. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> of course. Thank you very much for checking in. Uh, it's the pre screen before the screen. <laughs> um, so, again, talking about how the beginning of the manuscript, beginning with Archbishop Romero, went amidst death threats by the right wing military for denouncing human rights violations during the Salvadoran Civil War, Romero declared that he was not afraid of death because he believed in resurrection. If killed, he would resurrect in the Salvadoran people. Shortly after, Romero was assassinated by the right-wing military while giving mass. In 1985, the Bread and Puppet Theater presented a play called The Nativity, Crucifixion and Resurrection of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador, his life, death, and dramatized resurrection in Nicaragua. So this study investigates the role of performance in resurrecting Romero's spirit and social justice legacy. Uh, I utilize social justice movement theory and a hybrid methodological approach drawing from autoethnography, historiography, oral history, and playwriting uh, to analyze primary and secondary sources and participant observations, uh, including my company apprenticeship to understand performance as manifestations of Romero. And my analysis concludes that upholding Romero's teachings through performance, like the play, The Nativity, but also performance like group actions uh, and behaviors embodies Romero's spirit. It held cultural, political, and personal implications for performance participants. It contextualizes bread and puppets praxis in the spirit of liberation theology, which is what we're gonna talk about today. And it fostered transnational solidarity activism between bread and puppet and Nicaragua's Mecate, a farm workers theater group. So cheapicity, communal work, collaborate. The Bread and Puppet Performs Liberation Theology. In this chapter, uh, I examine Bread and Puppet as a collective, right, through participatory observations conducted during apprenticeship in 2016. Specifically, this chapter explores Bread and Puppet's company praxis as performance of liberation theology, which in short is an interpretation of the Christian faith through the suffering of the poor. Uh, a critique of the systems and ideologies that oppress the poor, and a critique of the role of the church and Christians uh, in that oppression, inspired by a Marxist socioeconomic analysis, all a direct Latin American influence tied to Romero's ethical stance, and therefore a performed manifestation of his moral spirit. This chapter reveals how Bread and Puppet Theater has developed countless performances that reflect these ideals and practices commonly associated with the teachings of Jesus Christ, as well as Karl Marx, and how these moral and political traditions interact with and translate to their work as a theater collective. The Bread and Puppet Theater 1960 to the present is one of the oldest, most significant protest theater groups in North America. It was co-founded by Peter Schumann, a German sculptor, dancer, puppeteer, and his wife, Elke Schumann, musician, puppeteer in her own right, and co-manager of the Bread and Puppet Press and Museum, which is one of the largest collections of puppets in the world. Sadly, Elka passed away late August, uh, last August, so we will evoke her spirit in this presentation today. Thank you, Elka. 
Brennan Puppet was one of the most active theater collectives during the anti-war movement of the 1960s, condemning US involvement in the Vietnam War, as well as the civil wars in Central America. Brennan Puppet is primarily recognized around the world for its oversized paper mache puppet aesthetic, carnival style, street performances, circus, and large scale outdoor pageant, among other works. Bread and Puppet really helped shape both American and international protest theater history. I was introduced to the social justice teachings of Romero, uh, beloved revolutionary priest and martyr of El Salvador, my parents' native country at a very early age. I grew up listening to stories of Romero's profound impact on the people of El Salvador from my family members, especially my grandmother, who would listen to his homilies and radio broadcasts during which he would report on acts of military violence against the people despite receiving receiving death threats by the right-wing government. Romero is considered one of the most beloved figures in Salvadoran and Latin American history. Though not directly affiliated, Romero advocated for human rights through the teachings of liberation theology. As Romero's influence among the poor and supporters of the Campesino movement increased through his radio talks, politically charged sermons and grassroots work with peasant communities, so did the threats against his life. Romero received death threats by the death squad and right-wing National Guard, including hundreds of threatening letters, attacks by the national press, and the Be a Patriot, Kill a Priest campaign, which through flyers posted throughout the country encouraged people to kill communist priests. During his final sermon, Romero made an appeal to the National Guard and the police, urging them to disobey orders to kill their fellow Salvadorans. He pleaded that instead enlisted men follow the orders of God's law, which states thou shalt not kill. He ended his sermon with a final plea to the military army, quote, I beg you, I beseech you, I order you in the name of God, stop the repression, end of quote. Romero's final words during mass were followed by thunderous applause, which interrupted the appeal at least five times and concluded with a final one minute long ovation. Romero's final servant became one of his most inspiring and controversial speeches, what many consider his ultimate death sentence. The conservative press and the right-wing government quickly accused Romero of treason for encouraging army men to defy government orders. Despite recommendations from his closest advisors, his legal counsel and personal friends not to make the controversial speech, Romero chose th to follow through with his homily. He believed it was his moral obligation to do so. Shortly after the speech, Romero was assassinated by the right-wing military uh, opponents of liberation theology while celebrating mass. On October 14, 2018, Romero was elevated to sainthood by the Catholic Church. According to an interview with the Schumanns, it was Romero's courageous appeal to the National Guard and his murder that inspired Bread and Puppet to tell his story. Thus, one year after Romero's murder, the Nativity play premiered in Vermont to North American audiences as part of the Bread and Puppets Our Domestic Resurrection Circus in 1982. The circus was developed in collaboration with Central American artists and was a large scale outdoor pageant with a series of sideshows, music and circus on the life and death of Romero with Romero as the central 20 foot puppet character as you can see on the pictures. A uh, bread and puppet then toured the nativity in Nicaragua in 1985 where as a result of the Nicaraguan revolution's cultural efforts, they were invited to tour the show. The play was performed in remote mountain areas on the steps of the cathedral um, during a demonstration outside the US embassy and on the stage of the ruins of the Grand Hotel. I was really inspired by the unique performance of Bread and Puppets to the Nativity because it invokes the metaphor of Romero's resurrection through theater, specifically circus and political puppetry. Journal entry stretched out in a welcoming embrace. I stand in front of the Romero puppet, and in less than two hours, I'm going to facilitate a talk on St. Romero and liberation theology. The Romero puppet has large paper mache hands stretched out in a welcoming embrace, surrounded by smaller to medium sized puppets, masks, and other pieces around its feet while hanging from the ceiling. I prepare for the talk, 
position some benches and pillows around the Romero puppet for seating, test out my recorder, sweep the floor, go through my notes in private. When in come a group of three white women in their late 60s, they walk straight towards the Romero puppet. Suddenly, I overhear them talk about Romero the man as if they knew him. Who are these women and how did they know Romero? I decide to introduce myself and invite them to the Romero talk happening later that day. According to the three women, they did missionary work in El Salvador during the war. And though they didn't work with Romero directly, they were closely, they were closely with others who had. The women in front of the Romero puppet recall how much of an impact Romero the priest had on their work in Central America. After a brief conversation, the women wish me luck on my presentation, excuse themselves and continue wandering about the museum. I couldn't believe what just happened. Surely this short encounter with the three nuns was the motivational boost I needed before my presentation. It had been 24 years since the Romero puppet was performed in the final Bread and Puppet Circus. 36 years after Romero's murder, I, a US born daughter of Salvadoran parents, stood in front of the Romero puppet. It was at that moment that my presence at the farm felt like a physical embodiment, similar to the Romero puppet, of a deep seated connection between bread and puppet theater and Central America. And what that relationship was precisely was yet to be discovered. Surprisingly, uh, neither Bread and Puppet nor Archbishop Romero were ever directly affiliated with liberation theology. And yet the company and Romero were consistently aligned with its core moral and political ideas. Romero truly embodied the spirit of liberation theology, so much so that he has inadvertently become one of the most recognized and highly regarded figures of the movement. While Bread and Puppet with its mostly agnostic membership whose North American premiere of the Nativity in 1982 was dedicated to liberation theology, have never outwardly claimed to be practicing theologians. Susan Green and Greg Guma discuss ties between liberation theology and the arts in their book, Bread and Puppet, Stories of Struggle and Faith from Central America, the only publication documenting the Nativity performance in Vermont. Specifically, Guma parallels Bread and Puppet's anti-war street performances during the Vietnam War and other social protests with liberation theologies, grassroots church and people movement. What is more, John Bell, renowned bread and puppet scholar and company member and one of my major contributors, adds that it's no surprise the theater developed such strong ties to liberation theology for they share, quote, a similar combination of moral idealism politics, and the stories of popular religion, end of quote, which is a common trait of Peter's work. The limited scholarship on the Bread and Puppet Theater and liberation theology exists. It primarily addresses Christianity's influence on Bread and Puppet stage performances. What remains unexplored is the impact of Christianity, specifically the teachings of liberation theology, on Bread and Puppet beyond its canon of theatrical work and onto its theater praxis. Yet the company's performed actions on and off stage during my apprenticeship demonstrate a deep rooted affiliation to liberation theology's political and ethical principles. Bread and Puppet's theater praxis as performance of liberation theology is relative to the work of Blaise Bompain, a human rights and peace activist with the Guatemalan Cursillo de Capitacion social program based communities as described in his book, Guerrillas of Peace, Liberation Theology, and the Central American Revolution. I argue that Bompain's three approaches to understanding liberation theology as one, a practice of democracy, a formation of community, and three, dialogical pedagogy, parallel three fundamental aspects of bread and puppet theater praxis, cheapicity, communal work, and collaborate. According to Peter, Bread and Puppet served as a, quote, a school, but not a school, end of quote, during which one could learn the important lessons of cheapicity, communal work, and collaborate. A fuller understanding of Bread and Puppet's performance of liberation theology can be gained by understanding the company's relationship to Christianity. S. Brecht, author of the Bread and Puppet Theater Volumes 1 and 2, dedicate several sections of the first volume to what he calls the, quote, Christianism of Peter's Theater. According to an interview with long-term puppeteer, there is always a quote, spiritual dimension to the content of Peter Schumann's work and an allusion to Christianity evident in the company's early performances. 
like incorporating Christian mythology figures into, into his plays and pageants, including dramatized representations of God, Jesus Christ, and Mary. Brecht argues that Bread and Puppet upheld a sort of, quote, religious air, end of quote, which manifests itself through Schumann's puppet aesthetic and choreography comparable to moments found in religious ceremonies and rituals. What Brecht considers a religious sentiment because of its emotional proximity to witnessing a supernatural event. He proposes that Peter's fascination with religious folklore as content for his work could stem from Peter's attraction to notions of good versus evil, a dominant principle in most Christian mythology, a universal theme that's quickly recognized by any theater audience, regardless of their religious affiliation or lack thereof. Bread and Puppets of the Nativity is a prime example of its adaptations of well-known Christian storylines through a contemporary framework that dramatized the life, death, and imagined resurrection of Romero like that of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Brecht also claims that the company name, Bread and Puppet Theater, is another example of the company's reference to Christianity. Peter bakes rye dough bread uh, with, on an open air baking shed and personally distributes to audiences after every performance. Peter's performance shares a striking resemblance to that of sharing Christian communion at the end of mass. Journal entry, something like a giant creature. Before arriving at the apprenticeship, I would daydream about my time on the farm, fantasizing about building bread and puppets trademark larger than life puppets. Surely I thought the renowned bread and puppet has the means to produce grandiose puppets as part of the apprenticeship. Unfortunately, that was never the case. It was not until the second day on the farm when the staff members gave us a tour that I realized the extent of Bread and Puppet's massive collection of masks, puppets, flags, and costumes preserved by the company throughout the years. It was gigantic. And yet one of the most impressive puppets I encountered was built with the most unconventional materials. It was a flat puppet resembling something like a giant creature with a rectangular body and massive arms. The puppet used in the performance of Faust III was made of stapled brown paper bags and was painted only with black paint. Peter led us through the series of exercises to move the puppet and make it a multi-dimensional character despite its flat appearance. The brown puppet was not the only sustainably sourced material object in the show that surpassed my expectations. We would create another massive character using only a recycled plastic tarp. We would gather underneath the tarp under dim stage lights moving about in unison. It was a surprisingly effective use of sustainably sourced materials that maintained the tradition of Bread and Puppet's aesthetic, but more importantly, its distinctive theater praxis, what Peter coined as cheapicity. My experience at the farm revealed Bread and Puppet's praxis of cheapicity was much more nuanced than frugality or mere presence for sustainably sourced materials. What is more, Nat Natalia Armia's Bread and Puppet Celebrates Half a Century article, Peter proclaims cheapicity as Bread and Puppet's own religion. In addition to its pragmatic function, cheapicity served as a moral and political ideology, which greatly influenced the theater's practice. Cheapicity, specifically the company's conscious application of Marxist analysis to its organizational structure, is a prime example of the theater's performance of liberation theology. Akin to the Marxist teachings of liberation theology, cheapicity also functioned as a critique of society's hierarchical power structures and capitalist ideals. Furthermore, we can interpret the Bread and Puppets interpretation of cheapicity as a practice of democracy in the spirit of liberation theology, similar to that of the Cursillos in Guatemala. Thus, the Bread and Puppet Theater performed democracy analogous to liberation theology's teachings through cheapicity as an anti-capitalist stance towards sustainability and the theater's collective authority praxis. The first example is the Bread and Puppets Why Cheap Art Manifesto, a published declaration of the theater's anti-capitalist approach to art production, is a written testament of the group's performance of liberation theology through the practice of democracy. And now I'm gonna invite my volunteers uh, who will be reading the manifesto for us. The Why, Why Cheap, Cheap Art, art manifesto. manifesto. 
people have been thinking too long that art, art is the privilege, is a privilege of, of the museums of and the rich. And the rich. Art, art is, is not, not business. business. It does, it does not, not belong, belong to banks and fancy, and fancy investors. Art is food. food. It can't, can't eat, eat it, but it feeds you. Feeds you. Art, Art has, has to be, to be cheap, cheap and available, and available to, to everybody. everybody. It, it needs, needs to be, to be everywhere, everywhere because, because it, it is, is the inside, inside of, of the world. world. Art, Art suits pain. Art, Art wakes, wakes up sleepers. sleepers. Art fights against, against war and stupidity. And stupidity. Art, Art sings hallelujah. hallelujah. Art, Art is, for, is kitchens. for kitchens. Art, Art is, is like good, good bread. bread. Art, Art is, is like green, green trees. trees. Art, Art is, is like, like white, white clouds and blue sky. sky. Art, Art is cheap. cheap. Hurrah! Hurrah. <laughs> Can we give them a round of applause for that performance? <laughs> So thank you so much to my volunteers. Uh, although the Bread and Puppet Theater could not exist entirely as a fully anti-capitalist entity while still being part of a capitalist society, its efforts remain in the spirit of cheapicity as laid out in the Why Cheap Art Manifesto of 1984. I further propose that the manifesto also functions as a performance script, which enacted by the Bread and Puppet guides its performances of an alternative economic system through art. Furthermore, Bread and Puppet's anti-capitalist performance and the commodification of art can be best observed through the Bread and Puppet Theater Museum. For instance, work is consistently produced through the Bread and Puppet Press, and yet Bread and Puppet does not produce work solely based on profit. Instead, the company created an anti-profit alternative economy based on public accessibility and an honor system. A prime example is the museum, which is free to enter and excluding the coldest months of the season remain accessible for the majority of the year. Additionally, there's never anyone working the museum store. Instead, there's a wooden container where folks can slip in payment uh, should they wish for the items that they purchase or take. By participating in the company's honor system payment process, visitors of the museum become participants in Bread and Puppet's performance of cheapicity. What is more, Bread and Puppet's option for a natural decaying process is another example of its anti-capitalist approach to the commodification of art. Unlike a traditional museum collection, the museum's puppets are not privately owned by major investors. Instead, the collection remains in the bread and puppet company's hands, which then makes it available for free public viewing. According to the company's website, the bread and puppet museum, quote, replaces the traditional museum's ideal of preservation with acceptance of more or less graceful and inevitable deterioration, end of quote, allowing for a potential shutdown of the museum's collection and welcoming the natural process of decay to take its place. Journal entry, a godlike figure. The apprentices, staff, and volunteers gather on the paper mache cathedral's dirt floor and play musical instruments during a performance of Faust III. Like an orchestra conductor, Peter stands in front of the group spontaneously waving his hands up and down, left and right, pointing his fingers at specific instruments for us to play, telling us when to stop, slow down, or keep going, and leaving the entire group in an original composition. I sit down at the front of the group, anxiously waiting for Peter to point my way so that I could play my miniature conga drum. There's an incredible amount of adrenaline rushing through my body as the sound of noise and strangely beautiful music fills the cathedral. My eyes remain fixated on Peter's hands the entire time. From where I'm sitting, Peter looks like a giant silhouette, otherworldly as the theater's lights frame his long white hair. No matter his hand gestures on stage, I can always make out the details of Peter's aging hands, each line and wrinkle. Despite Peter being in his early 80s, he held such a powerful presence. His movements and gestures were so graceful and silly at the same time. With Peter, it was always an unpredictable performance. You were never sure what he would do, but you knew it would never be boring. After all the years of reading about the company, I could not believe that I was here performing with Bread and Puppet while in the presence of greatness. For me, looking up at Peter during the Faustler performance was one of the most meaningful moments throughout the apprenticeship. It took me a few days to have the courage to speak to Peter and weeks before I would ask for an interview. 
Like most of the apprentices, I was completely starstruck whenever Peter would come by. In some ways, we were all here because of his legacy as part of the American political theater movement. It was not until he started spending more time with The Apprentice, teaching us about the paper mache process, showing us his goofy dances or sharing funny anecdotes by the outdoor oven, that I witnessed several layers of Peter's complex authority and leadership personality, including what some staff argued as a softening of his notorious temper during the apprenticeship. I was even fortunate to interview Peter and Elka in their living room. Peter was incredibly humble and warm during the interview, serving me hot tea and making funny jokes throughout. Over the next few weeks, Peter would continue to push and challenge us during rehearsals. His demeanor would gradually change as he became more relaxed, comfortable and friendly with the participants. Peter was no longer an intimidating godlike figure. He was less threatening and more approachable, human even. Peter has in many ways become the face and patriarch of the company. Uh, as Brecht further adds, in the 60s, the group was even referred to as Peter Schumann's Bread and Puppet Theater. And in the 1980s, members of the group remained anonymous in most Bread and Puppet programming. Of course, Brecht's observations on Peter's authority as a German male poet and scholar stem from a mostly outside analysis of the company's earlier years, specifically from its origin to the 1980s. While my observations as a woman of color, artist and scholar refers to Bread and Puppet from firsthand and contemporary perspective 36 years later. In 2016, how was Peter's authority manifested on the forum? In what ways could Bread and Puppet's practice of democracy through performance of collective authority in the true spirit of liberation theology exist? One of the complexities I examine in the chapter is collective authority, uh, as I observed, was through the lens of feminist liberation theology, uh, where efforts were made to create institutional change and recognize women as significant contributors of the Catholic Church, specifically through the redistribution of power. The bread and puppet performance of collective authority was based on a similar principle, reallocating authoritative roles to group members like women. And yet Bread and Puppet's theater performance of collective authority both honors feminist liberation theology's vision, but it also incorporates a feminist strain. For instance, though positions of influence and authority are distributed among women on the farm, Bread and Puppet's sole creative authority continues to be Peter. For the most part, Peter maintains artistic control and has final say in all creative prospects. Thus, Peter remains the highest authority and most powerful individual in the bread and puppet farm, despite the countless creative contributions among the staff. However, my participant observations and interviews conducted with several staff reveal that bread and puppets collective authority, though far from perfect, have evolved and now include more opportunities for sharing creative control. For example, women staff members interviewed were not limited to administrative or supervisory roles, but were also critical to the company's creative decision making. On several occasions, women staff members spearheaded writing of scripts, directed entire rehearsals, and coordinated circus acts while also leading administrative roles. What is more, Peter is more welcoming and encouraging of creative contributions from staff members though not without the occasional bumping of creative minds or compromises and negotiations. Women interviewed during my study included um, Lily Lamberta and Esteli Kitchen discussed several instances where they have openly disagreed with and or challenged Peter's creative autonomy. In these instances, staff members have come to mutual agreements with Peter, made compromises, and even learned to navigate his authority while still finding equal footing to make creative decisions together. Perhaps it's not that Peter grants more authority now than before, but that staff members, women in particular, are also asserting creative power in their own ways. Bread and Puppet's collective authority today is paving the way for sharing of creative control, all while simultaneously honoring its co-founder's unique vision and upholding the beloved Bread and Puppet aesthetic. While collective authority is dispersed throughout the farm, little has been documented regarding women's authority and their impact on the company. I respond to Breck's observations of Peter as the sole bread and puppet patriarch by documenting the theater's leadership from a contemporary context observed during my apprenticeship and centering the roles of women as collective authority. In this chapter, I include narratives on Elka, Lila Weinstead, Lin Linda Elbow, and other younger women staff that embody the vision of feminist liberation theology in creating institutional change. 
These narratives help us recognize women as pivotal contributors to the bread and puppet legacy. When they asked for volunteers to work with Elka in the Bread and Puppet Museum, I jumped at the opportunity to work with her in person. Unlike Peter, whom I had read about, I did not know much about Elka. Unlike uh, on the first workday, Elka gave our small group a private tour throughout the two floor museum, once an 18th century dairy farm. Elka, who was in her early 80s then, was a bread and puppet historian, recalling the intricate details of hundreds of performances or anecdotes for every puppet displayed from the company's more than 50-year trajectory. Elka then showed us the storage room, which was filled with merchandise and overstock, and walked us through the museum press shop. She then took us outside the main entrance to a wooden bench where a small wooden puppet covered in a small blanket lay sleeping. According to Elka, this was the museum guard and the museum was not officially open until we woke the puppet guard and put on his little red hat. During my final week at the farm, I offered to help Elka with any additional tasks she might have. And she invited me over to her house to help with some organizing. I was excited to spend quality time with her before the end of the apprenticeship. Peter and Elka lived in a quaint little two-story cottage style home. It was modest and eclectic up the hill from the main house. Elka insisted the first thing we do before organizing was to sit and have tea. She did not have to ask me twice. We then proceeded to fix a plant that was damaged from a rainstorm the night before, hung Peter's laundry outside in the clothes hanger, cleaned the kitchen area, all while sharing stories of our families and other random things. The apprenticeship was coming to an end and I knew that I would miss our time together. So I made sure to take my time with all my tasks. Elka did not seem to mind. Um, she simply carried on with all of her work, primarily answering calls she received from the company, including questions about the circus that day, handling booking matters, the Bread and Puppet Museum and the printing press. We then headed back to the museum to gather postcards, posters and other items she graciously gifted the apprentice leaving that week. Elka made sure everyone had an equal number of items to take home as a token of appreciation for their work on the farm. She was truly a kind and generous leader. Though Elka presented a softer leadership style than Peter, she nonetheless wielded as much power and influence, beginning with the Bread and Puppet Farm. It was Elka's family that purchased the Glover Farm in 1970 and 1974 gifted the land to Peter uh, and Elka for the Bread and Puppet Theater when they first relocated to Vermont. Bread and Puppet had acres of land to grow the company, house the staff, perform the workshop, workshop new acts, build an indoor theater, host a circus and store its puppets. Many consider Elka's family gift to the Schumanns as largely responsible for the company's longstanding trajectory. Elka's role in directly overseeing the Bread and Puppet Museum was one of great influence because it preserved the company's history and allowed it to be shared with a wider audience. Her firsthand accounts, multifaceted perspective, and fascinating company anecdotes were astounding. Elka's scope of bread and puppet knowledge was undeniable and reflected the weight of her authority on the farm. In addition to running administrative and curatorial business in the Bread and Puppet Museum, Elka was also responsible for managing the books, coordinating tours, and handling company accounts for years. Elka has also significantly shaped Peter and the company's political consciousness. She is recognized for politicizing Peter early on in their relationship, and as the company's co-founder, continued to influence the company's political subject matter. Tamar Schumann, Peter and Elka's daughter, claims it was Elka who pushed for the inclusion of women's social issues in circus productions. Elka was the company's soundboard and the most keen critic and the only other person who had remained with the company since the beginning. Furthermore, interactions with Elka during the apprenticeship proved she remained a powerful image figure within the company. On several occasions, Peter would rely on Elka when making final decisions, while the staff continued to consult with her in all aspects of the farm. It was evident that Elka remained Peter's greatest collaborator, and in an interview with Peter, he credited Elka for the start of the company. Journal entry, Grand Epic and Yellow. For me, the Yellow Act was one of the most high energy, elaborate acts of the circus, mainly because there were so many people on stage at the same time. I selected a large yellow paper mache lion with a long neck and flowing headdress flowing from its side. Two small eye holes were placed in the mast center, making it impossible for me to see right or left. 
I realized early on that I had much to learn about movement with large puppets. Nevertheless, I chose this puppet for the grand finale. The first time I perform in the yellow act, it's a complete disaster. By the time we approach the end of the circus, I'm drenched in sweat, my dress is falling off, I'm exhausted and utterly lost, and we still had to do an entire pageant after the circus. I quickly scramble backstage, a tent behind the circus bus, to find my yellow act puppet and costume as the band cued us to enter the stage. Suddenly the yellow act is up, I hear voices, let's go, let's go, and a mob of people rush towards the stage, dancing and moving around in their yellow costumes. I don't even know how I found my way to the stage without falling on my face. Someone grabs my arm and helps me find my mark. Although the music was loud, I could still hear folks calling towards one another, yelling for people to get to places before the yellow sun appeared on stage. I'm partly crying, partly laughing hysterically inside the darkness of my yellow lion mask, catching glimpses through the tiny eye holes of folks in similar positions, wandering around the stage like drunk toddlers, being redirected and rescued by other performers with more visibility. It was a complete train wreck, train wreck and certainly felt like a circus moment. Suddenly the music shifts and the yellow sun appears on stage. A few folks tap me to move to my right and gently nudge me to walk towards the center of the stage. All I can see are my bare feet on the field grass stumbling to the beat of the music. So I follow their voices and finally reach my destination, making my final gesture towards the grandiose yellow sun. The music stops and then a roaring applause from the audience. They love it. We all rush backstage laughing and congratulating each other for finishing our first circus on the farm. I never imagined, never figured out what the meaning was behind the yellow act. I don't think any of us ever did, but that didn't matter. All we knew was that this was the circus finale and it had to be grand, epic, and yellow. I came to accept that there would be many more moments of complete chaos like this, which no matter how much training I had, I could never navigate on my own. I would almost always rely on the generosity and guidance of my fellow apprentice. Had it not been for everyone's collective work on stage, I would have never found the light of the yellow sun. The Yellow Act was one of many introductions to Bread and Puppet's take on communal work, which shared a similar praxis to that of the Cursillo programs in Central America. Cursillos were formations or uh, base communities, service communities, and communal work um, that merged through Marxist and Christian dialogue. The Cursillo programs adhered to liberation theologies quote, preferential option for the poor, end of quote, and worked in solidarity with campesino and indigenous communities on agrarian reform and peasant liberation. Similarly, Bread and Puppet's work was founded in a philosophical doctrine of solidarity with the struggle of oppressed peoples worldwide, often showcasing characters based on peasants or proletarian people. Both the Cursillo programs and the Bread and Puppet apprenticeship were rooted in communal work and service in the name of social justice. Comparable to a base community, the Bread and Puppet's apprentice and staff efforts were motivated by the spirit of communal work and not individual endeavors, which supported the collective needs of the company and addressed the current social and political state of the world, this time through theater. Communal driven work, life and play on the farm is one of the Bread and Puppet's most distinguishing qualities. In the span of five weeks, the collective participated in weekly, sometimes daily farm chores, including but not limited to assisting the cooking staff, preparing and serving the daily meals for the company, sometimes in full costume. We also cleaned and stocked the public outhouse for company members and audiences, reorganized the paint shop, music rooms and other spaces, hand painted bread and puppet posters in the print shop, paper mache and completed puppet repair, gardening, etc. In addition to our farm chores, we produced an impressive amount of theater, including daily rehearsals and weekly theater performances, street parades, an outdoor circus, pageants, among others. For many interviewed, communal work was a distinguishable quality of the Bread and Puppet Company, not limited to the amount of work produced, but also the spirit in which we produced the work. Long after my yellow act debacle, which I have to say improved significantly since the first circus, I met with Jason Hicks, another longtime staff member and puppeteer and talked about communal work on the farm. 
Hicks, like most other apprentices and staff members, was a multi-talented puppeteer and activist and member of the Brennan Puppets Live Band. We talked about the unique qualities of communal work at the farm and his sense of belonging to the Brennan Puppet family, which he lovingly described as a dysfunctional family. Hicks later talked to me about Brennan Puppet and the do-it-yourself activist ethics as part of the family dynamic. What I found most compelling about Hicks' take on communal work is the argument towards building something greater than ourselves and working beyond our personal needs towards the bigger idea. The very essence of service throughout the Brennan Puppet apprenticeship stemmed from perform acts of selflessness, evident in the admirable work ethic and duty of the staff and apprentice, selflessness void of artistic ego or ambition and service through labor and humility. Not all apprentices welcome the idea of forbearing their individual creative projects to fulfill the needs of the project, of the company, a tension I explore in the chapter. But as time progressed, it was evident that the apprenticeship would require a level of altruism and humility we had not anticipated, and firsthand experience of liberation theology, spiritual, moral, and ethical teachings of service. Bread and Puppet Praxis is a performance of communal work, reimagines communal work in based communities through a secular lens. I roam the theater grounds on the final day of the apprenticeship. I take all the final pictures, video I need to document the wonders of the farm, desperately trying to capture every bit of its magic through my camera. I make sure to pay a last visit to the Romero puppet before my departure and walk through the museum floors. There's no visitors or apprentice roaming the space or in the print store below, no groups of people being guided through one of Elka's famous tours. It's just me and the Romero puppet. This was not the first time I find myself in intensely staring at the puppet, secretly hoping it will respond with a smile. Throughout the apprenticeship, I would often come here to spend alone time with the Romero puppet, as I had done so since my first day on the farm. I facilitated all my group interviews, hosted my talk on liberation theology, and worked on my presentation notes in front of the Romero puppet. Visiting the Romero puppet was the first thing I did when I arrived at the beginning of summer, and it would also be the last thing I did before I left. The first moment I saw the puppet at the beginning of the apprenticeship was surreal and in a weird way spiritual. I never imagined the presence of a puppet would have such an emotional impact on me. For this final moment, I wanted to give thanks to Romero, who I felt was present throughout my entire experience, guiding me and inspiring me along the way. Romero's spirit was with me indeed, embodied within the large-scale puppet in front of me, manifested by the farm's green fields and pine forest, inside the dirt floor and puppet-covered walls of the paper mache cathedral, and epitomized in the work of the Bread and Puppet Company. Turns out I would find myself in front of the Romero puppet once again in a few years, still taken aback by its grand presence and still waiting for it to smile. My witness to and participation of um, Brennan Puppet's performance of cheapicity, communal work, and collaborate during the apprenticeship instilled in me a deeper understanding of liberation theology and Romero's work than I had ever imagined. First, Brennan Puppet's cheapicity as a critique of capitalist societies echoed Romero's stance against systemic structures that resulted in economic inequality, war, and the suffering of the poor in El Salvador. Second, Bread and Puppet's praxis of communal work upheld Romero's spiritual and moral responsibility to the marginalized poor, which was rooted in service and selflessness. And last, Bread and Puppet evoked Romero's dialogical approach to working alongside marginalized people by embodying the teachings of God's love for all. After five weeks at the apprenticeship, I knew that I would return. Similarly, I came in contact with people who had worked with Bread and Puppet that also returned to the farm each year. It was evident that their experiences at the farm played a significant role in their lives, and visiting the farm was a king to visiting family. I wondered what it was exactly that made people return to the Bread and Puppet each year. During my interview with Linda, she described the extended Bread and Puppet's generations from across the globe as part of, quote, a gigantic onion that is a layer after layer after layer of people who work with us. Some people have stayed more or less consistently, and sometimes other people just hop back out of the blue, people you have not seen in 30 or 40 years, end of quote. According to Linda, the reason why people returned to Bread and Puppet was probably, quote, probably out of curiosity and probably out of love, end of quote. 
My curiosity about Bread and Puppet and its relationship to Central American politics motivated me to apply for the apprenticeship and inspired me to conduct this study. However, it was my subsequent love and admiration for Peter, Elka, the company staff, apprentices, and former company members who best embodied the legacy of Romero that drove me to return. When I did return three years later, I could still feel Romero's presence amongst the work and people I encountered. It has been 40 years since the birth of the Romero puppet, and Romero's spirit of brotherly love continues to be resurrected throughout the Bread and Puppet Theater. His teachings of social justice, economic equality, humility, and commitment to service continue to influence the company's work today. Romero's spirit is a critical part of the fabric of Bread and Puppet Theater history, a living manifestation of the theater's global family, like one of the many layers of an onion. Thank you. And scene. Thank you. <laughs> and scene. Thank you so much, Yamara, for your presentation um, and for taking us on this journey so that we could all engage with art, theater, and the legacy of St. Oscar Romero. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you already, and I see some coming through the chat. We only have five minutes, so we'll only get through a couple of them. Um, but let's see. Let's see what we can get through. Mm -hmm. um, so you you talked about having a lens of feminist liberation and the need to recognize women as significant contributors of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, I'll read a couple questions and you can feel free to respond to, to any of it. How do you think that this art form, um, a theater helps us in understanding religion as political and revolutionary when many Latinxes in current generations mm -hmm. that have been othered by um, religion may not view as religion as the most progressive cultural space? Mm -hmm. That's one, one heavy question. And the second, which is similar, is what can we take from the bread and puppet theater or liberation theology that can help us become better activists, protesters, citizens? Okay, uh, where's the first one? I just want to read that. That's such a rich question. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll send it, I'll send it your way, but I'll read it okay. now. How do you think that this art form theater helps us in understanding religion as political and revolutionary when many Latinxes may not view religion as the most progressive cultural space? Yeah, I would say that the power of theater is really challenging and exploring and reimagining, uh, you know, these institutional practices. And I think being able to question that, right, to find a way to to envision the type of world that we want to live in through theater and the type of uh, relationship that individuals want to have where we feel included uh, and wanted and participants of creating a better world. So so yes to questioning, yes to challenging uh, religion as an institution, you know, uh, and I think theater is such a great way to explore that, to be able to think about our own lived realities and what we need and how we are empowered to create our own destinies. And that's something that is part of liberation theology, that uh, we all have innate uh, creativity and uh, intelligence and contributions to make to create our own paths, right? Not necessarily based on the, the systems that we are oppressed by or the type of lives that we are living. Um, if that answers that question, uh, but yes, to inviting that critique, that that's the challenging part of, uh, I think, liberation theology that many question is like, well, are we questioning the church? Yes, we are. Yes, we are questioning the church and our role in um, adhering to um, love and compassion, but through the framework of social justice. Great, thank you. Another question that came in the chat, since we are in Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. most yeah. of us at least, how familiar is the Salvadoran community in Chicago, including Centro Romero with your research? And how do you see this or future engagement informing your work? Yes, great question, Rosa. <laughs> um, I have actually, um, one of the chapters of my dissertation of this manuscript is a chapter that I wrote about Oscar Romero and really kind of understanding what does it mean to be resurrected, right? How do we embody and manifest someone's social justice legacy? So I'm using theater to explore that, right? Dramatic writing to explore that question. And I'm actually partnering with the Centro Romero uh, and UIC School of Theater uh, and Music, as well as hopefully the Latino Cultural Center uh, and the Latinx community to be able to bring um, do a community reading of this play in the spring of 2023. Um, and as an organizer, you know, I'm not from Chicago. I just moved here in August. So I'm building, you know, um, roots and planting seeds and building relationships with organizations and supporting their work so that we can collaborate. And um, Centro Romero was one of the first places that 
uh, one of um, a faculty member in the Department of Theater also mentioned you should reach out to them. And I did. It was one of the first things I did when I got here. And so we are in partnership with each other. Um, I just did a, a Theater via Press workshop for them uh, two weeks ago, <laughs> you know, supporting their work, getting to know them, and hopefully they'll get to know me. But uh, they are on board with supporting this project because their, their work is a manifestation of Romero spirit. You know, they're doing that work and have been doing it for several years in the Chicago community with refugee and migrant community. So um, they're, they're a perfect partner to be able to work with. Um, so I do, I, I am hoping and I'm planting the seeds and putting in the work that, that I can collaborate with the Latinx uh, and the Central American community that I'm, I'm trying to find and get connected to in Chicago. But overall, just communities that believe in social justice and, and, and theater as a vehicle for consciousness raising and community building, which Thank Chicago so is very rich in that. Mm -hmm. I'll ask, um, we're at time, but I'll ask one final question. <laughs> since since we, were, we had so many, um, I would be remiss to, to not ask one more. Um, as we think about theater as a, an art as a tactic within social protest, and you talked about protest theater performances. Um, what influence from art, puppets, theater have you seen used in tactics in current social movements, whether that be migration, environmental climate justice, that stand out to you? And how do you see art um, serving in conjunction with other tactics often used like civil disobedience, et cetera? Um. Yeah, I feel that it, everything is always interconnected. You know, I love how um, in the past, you know, since 2020 and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and folks wanting to be more actively involved in activism and uh, and being allies and, you know, be, being able to engage with communities that folks we're already doing this type of work. You know, there are so many activists that were already integrating art into the work that they were doing with community. And then artists who were integrating uh, civil disobedience, relationship-based community organizing, you know, the uh, different types of techniques and merging them together. And I feel that there's a strong uh, need for uh, including those elements, but there's also a lot of work that has already been done. And, and I'm, I'm so excited to see that people are being recognized for the, the work that's already been done in the communities and how do we support people who have been doing this for years you know um, and not just because it's cool to do it now but also because they've been planting uh, building those foundations from the beginning um, I think I went off on a little tangent I don't know if I answered your question but I, I do <laughs> that it's something that I'm seeing um, much more of a need for people are much more open to thinking of what are the different ways that we can engage in these uh, issues, you know, in building solidarity with folks uh, in being allies, you know, in uh, promoting social justice and change institutional change. Uh, and I think art has always been a vehicle to do that. And maybe it's getting the type of recognition that I think it deserved because um, the work has always been there and people have been doing this work for years, both activists and artists. Thank you for making that connection. Um, and thank you again, Chris Yamada, for sharing your research with us. You've given us plenty to continue thinking about after this event. We will collect all the questions that people submitted and send them your way. Um, Thanks for listening to my stories. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in the comment wrote, what a rich talk. Thank you for sharing your presence and work with us. Um, okay, well, that brings us to, to the end of the event. Thank you again to everyone in the space. Please join me as you already are in thanking our speaker by using the chat or the reaction button. Um, and we hope you can all join us for our next and final radical research from BIPOC scholars presentation scheduled for Wednesday, April 13th at 3 p.m. with Dr. Monique Holt from Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, yeah, you can register for this and other events uh, by the LCC on our website and our social media. This brings our program to a close and thank you all for joining us. Have a lovely day, everyone.